Johnny Tremaine, Chapter 2, The Pride of Your Power The week wore on, each day as hot as the one before, for it was July. Every day after dinner, Mr. Lapham took a long nap under his basket, snoring as gently as he did everything else. Johnny would let him sleep for an hour, then wake him up, scold him, and get him to work. His work was beautiful. The body of the sugar basin was quickly completed, and he began reposeing on it the rich garlands of fruit with the same skill he had had 40 years before. Johnny's own work did not satisfy him as well. He had exactly enlarged the handle in his wax model. Mrs. Lapham and the girls, even Mr. Lapham, said it was fine, and he could go ahead and cast it in silver. It was only Johnny himself who was dissatisfied. Friday evening, when the light was failing and work over, Johnny took the silver pitcher and his own wax model and left the shop. He was in Fish Street in a minute, stopping outside the silver shop of Paul Revere. He didn't dare knock, but he knew that any moment now the silversmith would be closing his shop, leaving for his dwelling in nearby North Square. He was so prosperous a smith that he did not live and work in the same place. So at last he saw Mr. Revere, a stocky, ruddy man with fine, dark eyes, shutting his shop, taking out his key, preparing to lock up. Good evening, Mr. Revere. The man smiled with a quick flash of white teeth. He had a quick smile and a quick face and body. Good evening, Johnny Tremaine. The boy had long admired Mr. Revere as the best craftsman in Boston. He had no idea Mr. Revere knew his name. He did not know that all the master silversmiths had an eye on him. Mr. Revere, I'd like to talk with you. Man to man, Mr. Revere agreed, opening his shop door, motioning Johnny to follow him. Johnny's eyes flew about the shop, taking in the fine anvils, the hood upon the annealing furnace, the neat nests of crucibles. It was just such a shop he himself would have when he was man-grown, not much like Mr. Lapham's. Although Paul Revere was as busy as a man as there was in all Boston, he took everything so easily in his stride, doing the one thing after another, that he never seemed rushed. So now, because an apprentice stopped him on the street and said he wanted to talk to him, he appeared to have all the time in the world. Sir, said Johnny, it's a matter of handles. He took the silver pitcher out of the cloth he had wrapped it in and his own wax model and explained Mr. Hancock's order. So you want to talk to me as silversmith to silversmith, do you? He had Johnny's wax model in his hands, delicate hands to go with such heavy wrists. What does your master say of your work? Mr. Lapham won't even look at it much, but he says it's good enough and I can go ahead and cast tomorrow. I've got to cast tomorrow because it's Saturday and we can't work on Sunday, and it must be done Monday at 7. Although my master thinks it's all right, I'm not sure. He is wrong and you are right. Look, you've just copied the handle on the pitcher too slavishly, just enlarged it. Don't you see that your winged woman looks coarse in comparison? I'd have the figure the same size on both pieces. Fill in with a scroll. Then, too, your curve is wrong. The basin is so much bigger, you cannot use the same curve. Yours looks hunched up and awkward. It's all a matter of proportion. He took up a piece of paper and a pencil and drew off what he meant with one sure sweep of his hand. I'd use a curve more like that, see? This is what I meant when I said I'd add a scroll or two below the figure of the winged woman, not just enlarge her so she looks like a Boston fishwife in comparison to the angel on the pitcher. See? I see. The man looked at him a little curiously. There was a time, he said, when your own master could have shown you that. Mr. Lapham is, well, he's feeble. Not doing very much work these days. Not what you'd call much, Johnny felt on the defensive. Not much fine hollow work. Plenty of buckles, spoons, and such. How many boys? Three of us, sir. I'd hardly think he'd need three. Now, if he wants to cut down, you tell him from me that I'll buy your unexpired time. 
I think between us, we could make some fine things, you and I. The boy flushed to think the great Paul Revere wanted him. Tell your master I'll pay a bit more than is usual for you. Don't let him shunt one of those other boys off on me. He stood up. It was time for Johnny to go. I couldn't leave the Lapham, sir, he said as he thanked Mr. Revere. If it wasn't for me, nothing would ever get done. They'd just about starve. I see. You're right, of course. But if the old gentleman dies, or you ever want a new master, remember my offer. So, then he turned to shake hands. May we meet again. By Saturday afternoon, Johnny followed Mr. Revere's advice and his curve had got the model of the handle exactly right. He could tell with his eyes closed. It felt perfect. He rapidly made a duplicate for when the molten silver was poured in on the wax, it would melt and float away. So he made a model for each handle. Now, no matter how long it took him, and if all went well, it should not be too long, he must get his handles cast, cleaned, and soldered to the basin itself, which Mr. Lapham had made. Of course, on Sunday, the shop would be locked up all day, the furnace cold. Mr. Lapham would, as always, escort his household, dressed in Sunday best, to the Cockrell Church, and after that, back for a cold dinner. Whether they went again or not to afternoon meeting, the master left for each to decide. He himself always went. Madge and Dorcas usually entertained their bows. Mrs. Lapham slept. Scylla would take a Santa out along the little beach. Johnny, Dove, and Dusty were apt to steal off for a swim, although Mr. Lapham had no idea of it. He thought they sat quietly at home and that Johnny read the Bible out loud to them. So Sunday was out, but if he got up at three or four Monday morning, he would have time to clean his work before he took it over to Mr. Hancock at seven. After Saturday dinner, Mr. Lapham, as usual, prepared for a snooze. Stretched out on the one armchair in the shop, with his basket over his head to keep off the flies. Perhaps Johnny's tyranny during the week had irritated the old gentleman, who never believed it made the least difference to anyone when anything was finished. Dove, Dusty, Johnny was yelling, build up the furnace, fetch in some charcoal. Hi, you lazy good-for-nothing dish mops. Dove ran out to the coal house. There was a queer, pleased look on his face when he returned. Charcoal all gone, Master Johnny. Gone? Yep, I haven't said anything because you always like to take charge of things like that around here. Get a basket quick. Run to Mr. Hamblin over on Long Wharf. Try Mrs. Hitchburn down on Hitchburn's Wharf. You've got to get charcoal. Hurry. Dove did not hurry. It was getting on towards sunset when at last he came back, pushing his big basket on a wheelbarrow. It was the worst-looking charcoal Johnny had ever seen. This isn't what we silversmiths use. This is fourth-rate stuff, fit for iron, maybe. You know that, Dove. Nah, not me. I don't know anything, see? You're always telling me. I want willow charcoal. You never said so. I'll go myself, but this delay means we'll work in lamplight and up to midnight. You are the stupidest animal God ever made. If he made you, which I doubt, why your mother didn't drown you when you were a pup, I can't imagine. Come Lord's Day and I have a spare moment, I'm going to give you such a hiding for your infernal low-down skulking tricks. You'll be... The basket over Mr. Lapham's head moved. He laid it down. Boys, he said mildly, you quarrel all the time. Johnny, in angry mouthfuls, told him what he thought about Dove and the charcoal and threw in a cutting remark about Dusty. The old master said, Dove, I want to speak to Johnny alone. And then, Johnny, I don't want you to always be riding them boys so hard. Dove tries, but he's stupid. Ain't his fault, is it? If God had wanted him bright, he would have made him that way. We're all poor worms. You're getting above yourself, like I tried to point out to you. God is going to send you a dire punishment for your pride. Yes, sir. One trouble with you is you haven't been up against any boys as good as yourself, or better maybe, because you're the best young one in this shop or on Hancock's Wharf. You think you're the best one in the world. Johnny was so anxious to be on with the work 
tediously delayed by Dove's tricks, he hardly listened. And boy, don't you go get all fretted up over what's, after all, nothing but an order for silver. It's sinful to let yourself go so over mundane things. Now I want you to sit quietly and memorize them verses I had you read about pride. Work's over for the day. What? Yep. It always was the old-fashioned way to start Lord's Day on sunset on Saturday, and I've decided to reestablish that habit in my house. Mr. Lapham, we've got work this evening. We promised Mr. Hancock. I doubt God cares even a little bit whether Mr. Hancock has any silver. It's better to break faith with him, isn't it, than with the Lord? Johnny was tired. His head was ringing. His hands shook a little. He walked out of the shop, slamming the door after him, and stormed into the kitchen. He knew Mrs. Lapham did not take much stock in her father-in-law's pious ways. She and all four girls were in the kitchen. Madge was frying cornmeal, Dorcas wringing out a cheesecloth. Scylla was setting the table, and Sana playing with the cat. Mrs. Lapham looked at him. Boy, have you seen a ghost? Johnny sat and told his story. He was beyond his customary abuse of eloquence. The girl stared at him with piteous open mouths. Mrs. Lapham's jaw set grimly. Dorcas, shut that door. Don't let your grandpa hear. Johnny, how many more work hours will you need? Seven, maybe. I can get two Monday morning. You shall have them, Sabbath or no Sabbath. That sugar basin is going to be done on time. I'm not letting any old-fashioned fussy notions upset the best order we've had for 10 years. And if Mr. Hancock is pleased, he may come again and again. I can't have my poor fatherless girl starve just to please Grandpa. Listen now to me. Sunday afternoon, Mr. Lampham was not only going to the second service as usual, but there was to be a meeting of the deacons, a cold supper afterward, and a prayer service at the pastor's. That's where you get them five hours, Johnny, tomorrow afternoon. Johnny knew that working on the Sabbath was against the law as well as against all his religious training. He might very well go to the stocks or to hell for it. But when Mrs. Lapham said, Darest to Johnny, he said, I darest. Not a word to the old gentleman, mind. Not a word. Girls, if you so much as peep, oh no, ma. Dove and Dusty were to be bribed into service by the promise of delivering the basin to Mr. Hancock when done. He always gave money to boys who brought things to the house. Mrs. Lapham was breathing hard, but she had the matter well in hand. It was settled. Is Santa, she said quietly, you call Grandpa and the boys in to supper. Scylla, run down cellar and fetch cold ale. Her mouth and the folds about it, even her nose and eyes, were like iron. And I think we'll pause here and continue with this chapter in the next video. Thank you so much for listening. I do love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.